With Ligari, you can update anything from a bathroom to a kitchen, a garage, back patios, and so much more. On today's video, we're going to show you how we updated this wood table to give it a new modern look that will last for years to come. We will show you our entire process from beginning to end. We'll explain everything that we're doing, showing you the proper way to mix, and even showing you how to fix your edges. Visit Ligari.com to get your products today and get started on your project. So I'm gonna go over all the supplies we're gonna use in this video. Um, you can get them on our website, ligari.com, under single items. Um, we're gonna be doing a white, basically stone kit process. We're gonna be doing white epoxy, pigmented white, and then our brown ligari effect. So this is gonna be really cool. We're gonna be doing larger pours. So we're not gonna be doing smaller cups, bigger pours, less veins, um, less modeling. They want more of like a natural kind of um, simple design so we're going to do larger pours so first thing we got our primer which is right here so we got our white primer we're going to prime the table with our white primer and then we have our pigmented white gallon and a half and a three quart kit when you guys are doing this process taping your edges um, you want to do about eight ounces per square foot our standard kits um, you do about four ounces so we do twice as much resin um, for our stone kit process which usually incorporates a dirty pour technique we got our drill, paddle mixer, um, measuring cups for our primer, 3 8 snap roller, de-shedded. Make sure you guys de-shed these, running them on some tape. That'll, that'll remove all the loose fibers. We have our containers for after we mix the resin to do the stone kit dirty pour process. Two five gallon buckets to mix all of our pigmented white. A couple stir sticks, five gallon, one gallon. We got our gloves some painters tape, yellow masking painters tape, that's to dam up the edges. And we have isopropyl alcohol or denatured and a rag for cleaning stuff up if we make a mess. And then this uh, table is kind of bowed. So it kind of has a slight bow in the middle and kind of levels out. So I'm gonna show you guys how to manipulate the resin, let it set up in a bucket. That way it doesn't move as much because if we pour this, this product out, even though we dam it up, it's gonna wanna flow out to all these edges. We tried to brace this up and get it as level out as we could. Still has kind of a bow to it. So I'm gonna show you how to manipulate the resin, let it set up in a container, and we're gonna be using a heat gun to know when the right time is to pour this out. Now, I highly recommend, if you're not very experienced with epoxy, to not do this. This is something that is pretty advanced. You need to know how to work with the resin. You know, be, be really familiar with it because what can happen is if you wait too long, the resin will start to heat up in the middle of the bucket and it'll become rock hard, it'll start to smoke, it'll get really hot, it can burn you. So again, this is for advanced epoxy stuff. If you guys are uh, new to the resin industry, you're not familiar with our products, don't let it sit in the bucket. Get your table stuff as level as you can, dump it out, your edges will just be a little bit thicker. Um, but this way we're gonna be able to get a, a nice even coat everywhere by manipulating it 
letting it set up. It's not going to flow out as much. It's not going to move as much when it's on the board. So we'll kind of go over that when we get there. Um, so yeah, so first thing we want to do, I'll just tempt the resin now. So we're going to cold warehouse here. So we are looking at resins at 57 degrees. So it's pretty cold. So we just want to take note of that. But first thing we're going to do is obviously prime. So I'll go over mixing the primer. We'll roll it on using the 3 snap roller. Um, and when we're doing a white primer over dark um, projects or dark counters or tables or whatever, we want to make sure our edges are perfectly white. Okay. So usually I like to do two coats over my edge so they're perfectly white. That way you can't see through the edges because sometimes the resin doesn't go as thick on your edges and faces. So we'll get right to it here. Primer guys, you need about 0.4 to 0.6 ounces per square foot. I made the full kit because we're all we're gonna do this project and then we'll come over here. I'm also gonna be filming this project. We're gonna do a really cool technique, pigmented white and some spray paints on this, this board right here. So I'm gonna obviously use the leftover primer to prime this board. That way we get a nice white canvas. When we're ever recoating stuff, even though it's already white, it's good to start with a fresh canvas. So we always like to reprime um, existing stuff that we're going over, especially if you're doing counters on your edges, right? Maybe you have a, a gray vein coming down and you might see that if you don't prime again. So that's why we always prime. Also, it helps with adhesion. So that's what the leftover primer's for. I'm gonna just dump a bead out right down the middle and we're just gonna cross roll this out. You guys will notice we have a lot of wood grain in this. If we were doing like a metallic base, you would probably see some of that grain because the metallics will settle in those low spots. Since we're doing pigmented white, um, it's not gonna settle like that. There's no metallics that will settle. So that's why I'm not worried about it being smooth, no grain here, and then kind of like a wood grain texture. If we were doing metallics, we'd probably want to fill that just because we had to sand the seams where we patched. So if you guys ever get fish eyes after priming or it's kind of like separating, just let it set up for like five, 10 minutes. It'll start to get tacky and then just roll over that. That'll eliminate any fish eye or separation in your primer. And then this is what I'm talking about on my faces. So I can kind of see through the brown wood, right? We want to make sure that's as bright white as we can get it. So I'll let this sit for like five, 10 minutes and then I'll just hit the faces again. I'm just worried about the, the vertical spot and this top corner. We want to make sure that's perfectly round. When you're doing Bondo, now I did the Bondo on this, so this is my fault, but I scraped it tight. You always want to leave it a little thicker on the top. Don't scrape it completely tight because after you sand, it kind of will settle in there. So we don't have perfectly flat lines here. And if this was a metallic epoxy pour, the metallics would settle in there and you'd, you'd kind of see like a ghost line. So whenever you're doing Bondo or filling seams, always fill them kind of high and that's what I did on the faces I just wasn't thinking like right here was overfilled and then sanded it looks perfectly flat where you can see kind of like an impression there and then the other thing Landon this is Landon's fault he sanded this with some really rough sandpaper so we have a bunch of wood burrs kind of sticking out of here we want to use like a fine grit so it doesn't chunk up that wood as much. Just a couple pointers for you guys to take note of when you're doing stuff like this. Corners, faces, sand them with a finer grit so it doesn't rough them up as bad and create like a bunch of wood pieces sticking out, little fibers of wood. 
any seams that you're filling, overfill them and sand them flush. All right, so we'll let this set up. I'm gonna go throw some primer on this other project we're doing. And then when I'm done with that, I'll come back here and hit these edges again. Then we'll throw a fan on this to just flash dry it because our primers dry really quick. And if you throw a fan on them, we can, we can coat over this in about 20, 30 minutes. Okay, so I'm gonna go over mixing, how to properly mix any resin, no matter how much you're making, what you're making it for. We, we came up with a process called 3P2 that ensures we're gonna have thoroughly mixed resin every time. We're not gonna have any soft spots on our pores and we'll be able to dump the bucket out or any container and let it completely drain out if we want and not worry about any unmixed resin on the sides getting on our project. So three stands for going up going down slowly hitting the bottom spinning it around coming up spinning it around at the top that's basically one so we do that three times and then we dump into a secondary mixing container that's pour so three and then p is pour and then we go up and down two more times in that secondary container and then we have thoroughly mixed resin you'll never have a spot soft spot um, and it's fast and there's no guessing of how long or how, how long you've mixed it. Is it good enough? It's always perfect every time when you mix like this. So we're temping this thing at 57 degrees. So whenever you're manipulating the resin, always have a temp gun. And again, this is for experienced installers, people that are very familiar with resin. Um, and we do not recommend this unless you're very experienced with, with our product. So what we're gonna do, we know the temp starting out and a good rule of thumb that we've kind of figured out is about 20 degrees from when you started, 20, 25 degrees higher is about the time to pour it out. So we're just gonna get this dumping out and this will take a little longer since it's thicker. So I'm gonna use a torch and this is the only time you guys will see us torch stuff in our warehouse. Get product to come out of the container faster. Get some out of the handle. So we want to let this drain out until it kind of start, slowly starts to stream out or drip. Again, since it's, since it's really cold, it's thicker, it's going to take it a little longer. If you guys want to warm up your resin, the easiest way, a uh, five gallon bucket, warm water, two gallon jugs will fit in there. Um, and I usually just will set it in warm water for like 20, 20 minutes, so warm it right up. Okay, now we're gonna add our part of our three quart kit. Awesome little way to get product out of, thick product out of containers. Obviously you don't wanna burn your hands though. Make sure we're not pouring part B's in also, all the part A's. So you guys get the idea, so we're gonna jump to adding the hardener and mixing. Okay, so now we got our, all our part A in there, gallon and half kit and a three quart kit of part A. And we'll temp this to see what we're at. 57 degrees. Now we're gonna add our part B. And this is obviously more fluid, so it's gonna come out a lot easier. Tilt it back, get the product out of the handle. Once that slowly starts to drip, cap it. Add our three quart B. So if you guys are just making a gallon and a half, big paddle kind of sticks out a little far. I like to use the small ones and you can fit that in there. Um, but since we're doing a three quart and a gallon and a half, we're gonna use a bigger paddle wheel. So I'm gonna go from the, the top to the bottom slow, spinning the drill fast. Once I hit the bottom, I'm gonna go around the bottom a couple times. And then I'm gonna come up slow. And 
then go around the top. So that's basically one. We're gonna do that two more times. And three, so now we're gonna pour into our secondary container. And we're gonna scrape everything out as much as we can. Scrape the bottom, scrape the sides. And notice when I pull my paint stick out, I'm tilting it up so it's not dripping all over past the bucket on the outside. Everything's kind of dripping inside the bucket. All right, now we go up and down two more times, and this is mixed to perfection. All right, guys, there you have it. So what I like to do when I'm done mixing, clean my paddle wheel in a bucket of denatured alcohol. We'll kind of show you a clip of that. Put your paddle in there, spin it a couple times, forward and reverse, pull it out, clean your shaft off, and then you'll have a perfectly new paddle wheel to use every time, and you can keep those buckets, slap a lid on them, and you can use them over and over before you have to replace the denatured alcohol in it. Very, very cool tip, and it saves your paddles from building up resin, because that'll eventually start to flake off and get in your mixes. So when we're manipulating resin, if I leave it in a mass this much in a bucket, it's gonna kick off faster. So there's a lot of variables in um, letting this resin set up and, and manipulating it. So what I like to do is just dump it smaller containers. So what we're going to do is basically our stone kit batches, our dirty pour batches, and then we're going to temp it from there because it's not going to be as much in a bucket. It's not going to heat up as fast because what will happen is it heats up from the inside and works its way out. So you always want to kind of stir it, check it, stuff like that. If you're leaving it in a, in a mass like this, um, you're gonna have to be more dialed in with your time, your temperatures, cause it'll go, it can go like that once it hits a certain point. So um, again, very experienced installers. This is not recommended um, to, to DIYers, first time users, stuff like that. So we're gonna get started on batching this out. So I got brown kind of mixed in there guys, or, or brown effects. Make sure you guys are shaking these up before you uh, squirt them out. And then um, I'll probably add some brown depending on how much is coming out. As I'm pouring it out, I'll maybe squirt some in there. But notice I'm pouring down some edges, one side of the containers. And again, doing bigger pours like this out of a two and a half quart container. You're not gonna get huge fracture veins like you would pouring out of a smaller container in multiple batches. Since we already did our, our stone kit batches, I don't wanna mix this with a stir stick, but you need to take note of the resin heating up in the inside and working itself out. So even though I'm temping this right now at you know 58, 60 degrees, the inside is gonna heat up first and so I want to be cautious of that. I don't want to wait until the outside 
temp is at like 80 degrees because what's going to happen is the inside is going to be a lot hotter and it could already start to clump up. So when you're doing this kind of process, when you're already batching it out, um, you can't really mix it because it's going to blend all the colors. So I want to probably dump this out. We started at about 60, 57. I'm probably going to dump this out at about 75. So once this outside temp is 75, that's probably going to mean the inside part of this cup is probably 80, 85 degrees. So just keep that in mind. If you're doing this with clear resin, letting it set up before you're adding your pigments, you can just mix it with the paint stick and kind of spread out the, the, the middle and get it spread out through the container and temp it. But again, if you're doing this where you're not going to be able to mix it, you want to make sure um, you're cautious of the inside always going to be hotter than the outside temp that you're getting. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll show you guys when we get ready to go, I'll put a stick in the middle, pull it out, and the inside part of the resin is going to be a lot hotter than the outside. So yeah, we're just going to probably let this sit here for, I would say, 20 minutes, um, and we'll keep checking the temp. So while that resin's heating up, because we're manipulating it, I'm going to tape off these edges now that the primer's dry. I like to go half on the face, half above it. There's one, and then we do one more row. Try to keep it at the same height. It doesn't have to be perfect. After you get it taped twice, you wanna really press the tape down good. All your sides. And then I always pinch the corners, adds a little tension to the tape. Press your corners down really good. Like I said, biggest thing is making sure these are tape sealed up good so we don't have any blowouts. And when you guys are doing this process, you gotta make sure your edges are clean after you sand and prep them. If they're not, you run the chance of the primer pulling off because there's a bond breaker between the primer and your top. So always clean your edges good with denatured alcohol, a rag, hit them a couple times, and if you do that, the primer will not pull off when we pull the tape. If you don't do that, you're gonna have primer pulling off. So make sure you're doing that. Cleaning them edges really good. Okay, so slowly climbing. It's been about 10 minutes, maybe 15 at most. Um, but again, remember, we started with this resin really cold. So if you guys start with the resin at like 70 degrees, it's gonna kick off faster. So there's a lot of variables when doing this. And that's why we highly recommend only doing this technique when you're an experienced installer, very familiar with resin. All right guys, so it's pretty much ready to go. And I'll show you what I was talking about. So if I temp the outside, it's coming in at 73. But if I temp the top, it's saying 88, 88, 87. So again, the outsides are gonna be a different temp than the middle. And then if I dip a paint stick in here, get down to the exact middle, and I temp this, we're at 96, 95 degrees. So again, there's a lot of variables when you're manipulating the resin like this. So even though you're temping it out here, you wanna check the inside. And again, hotter environments are gonna flash them off sooner, so you really gotta pay attention. Um, but this is ready to go. So again, center is going to be the hottest point of the, of the mix. You always want to temp that area versus just temping the outside. So we're going to take these over and dump them out. And then keep in mind, guys, obviously the inside of that's at like 9,800 degrees. So it is going to be hot. Definitely do not want to be burning yourself. So be cautious of that. So again, we're going for a more subtle pour. So we're just going to kind of dump this out in straight lines everywhere. Notice how I don't have much brown coming out, so I'm gonna add some brown into the top here. Some of the brown effects.
And then I'm always taking note of what colors are coming out. Obviously I had a really nice vein colors coming out over there. So I'm gonna pour this one starting on the other side. Maybe come into the middle here. And then again, we're gonna add some more brown to it. All right, so what I'm gonna do now, get rid of any surface tension out here and kind of see how thick the resin is from letting it set up in the container first. Go around, hit all our edges, make sure everything's slicked off with resin so it can level out. Obviously you wanna go same pattern. I don't wanna start blending it sideways or something. I wanna go with the veins that I have going on out here. All right, so was that the center of the resin was at like uh, about 100 degrees. So if I temp it now, 74, 71, 59, 77. So you can see it cooled back, cooled back down a little, but that doesn't matter. It's still gonna set up a lot faster and it's a lot thicker, so it's not gonna move as much. So again, this table kind of had a bow to it. It's not gonna kind of flood out everywhere to the low points as much because it's a lot thicker now it's gonna set up a lot faster. And that's one of the reasons why we, why we manipulated this pour is to make it not run and stuff. Another thing is I can pull my tape edges a lot faster because the resin's a lot thicker. It's setting up faster. So I'll be able to pull my tape and let it flow over the edge a lot faster than, than if I was to just dump the resin out right away. So we like to, when we do projects, we'll manipulate the resin all the time, let it set up in a bucket, dump it out, and then we're able to pull the tape about the time that we're done with our design and we're not waiting around for the resin to set up. It doesn't drip as much and it also coats your edges um, a lot thicker because there's a lot more material flowing over um, instead of just kind of dripping off. So after I got everything leveled off, there's still a few spot. Well, there was a spot here, but it's already kind of filling in. I think there was another one, maybe right here, right? I always want to make sure we're hitting those, um, but I want to blend in some, I want to kind of, fine tune some of these spots. This is absolutely beautiful. There's just some spots out here that don't exactly look natural like this guy right here. So I'm gonna, we cut down our Ligari squeegees and I'm just gonna kind of blend this. You can do it with your hand as well, but I, your, your fingers are a lot thicker. I want more of a, a, skinny, a skinny vein through here. So I'm just gonna kind of just blend that out a little bit just so it doesn't look like a a half circle right there at the end, kind of give it more of a natural look right there. And then any other spots like this, I'm, I'm okay with that. Even that guy's not bad. So yeah, if there's any spots that you don't, don't like, just kind of blend them in, fine tune them how you want. And then we're gonna go to this guy. We're just gonna kind of pat him in a little. That way he can level out. You kind of see how sticky the resin is already. And it just cuts down your cuts down your time of waiting a lot when you're doing that. So I'm not going to spray this one with isopropyl. I don't want it to sell out. So all I'm going to do is mist it with denatured alcohol and that's going to help it lay out glass smooth. Um, and then we'll let this probably sit for maybe five, 10 minutes and we'll pull the tape off and, and show you how to coat the edges. But again, since we let this set up in the container, we're able to pull the tape on the edges a lot faster than it was if we were to dump it out right after mixing. All right, so now I'm gonna mist denatured alcohol on it. Um, and it, again, guys, this helps eliminate any, any air, helps it release, and just makes this resin layout glass smooth. All right, so while that's evaporating, I'll show you how we check for the right time to pull the tape. I'll peel it back kind of see it's, it's, it's moving a little fast, slow, but it's still a little fast. I like it to kind of slowly move. 
So we'll let this set up for maybe 10 more minutes. And obviously if you're coating a thicker edge, you're gonna probably wanna pull it about that time. But this is a pretty thin edge. So we're gonna let this set up for probably 10, 15 minutes and then we'll pull the tape. All right guys, so the edges are all coated. Last thing we do is scrape the drips. And we obviously want to, it's always good to check your drips throughout the curing process over the next hour or so. Just make sure you don't have any like runs or spots that don't look good because we can address those with a paintbrush. We can add some more product. Maybe your corner right here, right? You can see through to the primer, maybe your corner. You can add some product, let it drip on your edge so you can fine tune your edges. So don't just assume they're done right when you're done and they're gonna look perfect. So now we're just gonna take a metal scraper, putty knife, and just knock off these drips. I like to use a metal scraper because it's really thin and it doesn't let the product build back up on the bottom lip of the counter. It kinda just kinda cuts it off. So perfect example, I can kind of see the wood there. I'm just gonna get a little product. And we're just gonna get it on that edge and that'll kind of drip off. That's kind of stuff I'm talking about. You can kind of fine tune any spots. It's still fluid enough to where that'll drip, flatten off, and then it'll be coated. Just to reiterate guys, when you're doing manipulating the resin like we did, there's a lot of variables that go into that, whether it's you're, you're mixing a lot in one bucket, right? The, the more in a mass, the faster it's gonna set up in the bucket. The temperature of the resin starting out, right? So always have a heat gun, constantly check it. Check the center of the bucket, because again, it's gonna start in the center. But you can see how easy it was and, and how fast we were able to pull the tape on the edges. It's not dripping that much. Right, so it just makes your projects go a lot faster. But again, it is for a more experienced, more advanced installer that's familiar with resins, preferably our resins. Um, but again, you know, you can do this with a lot of different products. Again, it's just, there's a lot that goes into it. Um, different temperatures, the amounts, the time it sits in a bucket. So just be cautious of that um, and you guys should be good. But, and another thing also, when you're doing larger projects, you obviously don't want them sitting in there as long because it's gonna take you longer to dump them all out. This is a relatively small project. We were able to dump all those buckets out in like three to five minutes. If you're doing a full kitchen, you're probably gonna be more like 20 minutes, maybe even 30. So you gotta account for that stuff too. Um, but we're gonna let this set up. I don't know what top coat they want on this. So um, if we are top coating or not, I'm not sure, but we'll find out and then we'll show you guys uh, final footage. Since it's day two, we need to sand anyways because we don't want to put our urethane over epoxy after 24 hours. We want to sand the surface so we get a good bond. Also, we're sanding because we have some debris that fell in this in the warehouse. We got a lot of stuff floating around. So I pre-sanded this left side, knocked down all the chunks, debris, fibers that fell in the resin as it was drying. We have a few spots, a um, few craters in here from a bubble that popped. And then we also have one out here right here, just a little guy, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you how to fill these if you have bigger ones. Um, sometimes you'll get some craters or just sometimes weird stuff happens with the resin. Now remember, we 
manipulated this resin. We let it set up to heat up so it didn't take as long to pull the tape and the design stayed um, a, lot, a lot crisper design, right? Didn't move as much. Um, just be cautious when you guys are doing that. If you wait too long and the resin gets too hot, you're probably gonna get a lot of bubbles that aren't gonna be able to self-release and pop because the resin is already thick, it's heating up. So just keep that in mind if you're doing that, you wanna really be on point. Don't let the resin get too hot. It's always good to put, pour the resin out about 75, 80 degrees once it hits that point. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna sand this. Faces and edges are very critical. We do not want to sand through our corners, our faces. Always use 220 grit. And even on the top, 220 grit, we don't want to scratch the surface a lot. So 220 grit, 320 grit. And I'll sand the faces with a palm sander. If you're not familiar with that um, or haven't done it a few times, maybe just sand them by hand because it is really easy to sand through the coating on the faces in the top corners. So I'll just do the palm sander. 220 grit, 320 grit, be real light. Always watch where I'm at and you can buzz your edges and stuff or just do it by hand, that's a safer bet. But I'm gonna sand this and then we'll show you how to mix up a little resin and fill um, any imperfections that you guys uh, might get in your surfaces. Cause again, um, no job's ever perfect and dealing with different environments, you're gonna have different things happen to your projects and this is one way to fix stuff like that. All right, so sometimes you'll get little lips that build up on the bottom edge. And I'm gonna show you how to sand those off. It really only happened in this area, and then we got this chunk missing. Um, didn't get bondoed, sanded. We should have filled that, but I'm gonna show you how to address that as well. So again, be real careful on your faces, but it's real simple, it's like this. So I'm always watching where I'm sanding, and I'm not necessarily, I'm just trying to sand this lip down. I'm not trying to sand here, just the spot that's sticking out. So you can see, I don't see a line. I kind of still see a line there. So this is good. So I don't want to really hit there anymore. And see, I'm really not touching up here with the sander. Kind of see I was turning it on and off, right? Turn it on, turn it off, so it's not uh, as aggressive and kind of repeat that. But now we kind of got rid of that lip on the bottom edge. And then obviously we can sand the bottom here to get that flat. That's relatively simple, but. And then I'll never sand corners with the palm sander just because you'll sand through almost every time. Do those by hand. Just kind of scuff them up a little bit. And then if you are sanding edges by hand, this is really all, again, we're just trying to scuff it up to get a good bond since this resin has been sitting so long. All right, so we got it clean, sanded. All the spots that we wanted to address, we, we sanded those flush. Um, I'm gonna show you how to repair vertical faces, which is very simple. We just use tape. I'm gonna mix some resin up. And then we're just gonna get some product on there, kind of fold it up, let it set up, pull it off, sand it flush. That's how we do vertical face repairs. Same thing with these, these bubbles here. I'm gonna do the same thing fill them, tape them, that'll hold it on there. Once it's cured, pull it off, sand it. Top ones, 
The ones in the top will obviously just put a little product in there. Those are fine. Um, so I'm gonna mix up a little more pigmented white. We don't need a lot, so it'll just be a little bit. When you're mixing small amounts, make sure you guys are really making sure it's right on the marks. It's really easy to mess up when you're making a small amount. Now, if I had a spot, maybe a bigger spot that had one of these colors running through it, I could take some of the effects and add those in there as well. But we have some pretty minor imperfections in this where the color's really not at, so I'm just gonna be doing just pure white. Another option is you could add a little effects to this to tone down the white so it's not as bright white. Like I said, just depends on what spots you're fixing on your projects. I'm gonna do the tops first. You can obviously just drip it off a paint stick to fill these top spots, but we'll use this little guy, this little syringe we got. And we're just trying to get it in there, overfill it, and then we sand it flush. So any, any spots out here that are have a hole in them, an imperfection, we're just gonna fill them. Overfill, sand it flush when it's hard. All right, so this spot in the face that didn't get filled with a Bondo, we're gonna address that now. I'm gonna put tape under it, press in the sides outside of where the hole's at, get some product on there. It's always good to overfill, like I said. Let that get hard, pull it, and then we'll sand it. Same thing on these little, little bubbles here. Get the, the tongue depressor out now. All right, guys, so we're going to let this set up. Once, this, once the resin's hard, I can sand it, pull the tape, sand it flush, and then we can apply our top coat. The repairs we did are hard, so now we can sand them. We got the top ones done. Uh, we got the faces done, so I'm going to go over sanding. Obviously, the tops are real simple, right? We can just buzz those flat, um, and we shouldn't even notice those repairs. Obviously, on the faces, we want to be more careful, move a little slower, and always make sure we're using 220 grit or 320 grit. We want to find sandpaper. That way we don't burn through the edges fast. And you'll notice I'll turn it, the sander on and off, turn it back on and off, just so it's kind of slowly sanding um, when I'm doing my faces. But I'll do the top real quick, and then I'll jump to the, the front edges. So this is where the, the edge was messed up. So we kind of filled this, and I'm gonna kind of sand this, round it down. And again, we're gonna be real careful when we're doing the faces. Okay, so now we have everything repaired, all the craters, the defects in the faces. So that's how you guys can repair um, any issues that you have on your, your project. So now we're gonna clean it really good, denatured alcohol, um, a, a lint-free um, rag, hopefully. Um, never wanna get a bunch of lint on it right before we do a top coat. And then we're gonna apply our matte urethane on this.
So now we got the table clean. So now I'm going to go over mixing and applying our WB urethane and we're going to be doing our mat. This also comes in gloss. Now the mat lays out completely flat. The, the gloss does have a, a minor texture to it, um, but that's what ad, adds, that's what helps with durability, scratch resistance, and stuff like that. So mat, very, very popular. It just gives you a real cool natural stone look when you do the, the mat urethane. Um, and it's really easy to apply. All I really need is I got my two ounces of water, mixing container, uh, three eighths nap roller, already de-shedded it, ran it on some tape, and then just a roller tray and a paint mixer. So um, we're gonna add the, shake up the part A. I'm gonna add this in here. And if you guys are splitting kits, this is, this is a counter kit, so it'll do 50 square feet. You guys can also split these up, mix up half of it. If you have a smaller project. Now we're gonna add the B. Don't really, I always add the water to the part B so you really don't need to shake it up or try to get all of it out right away. Add our two ounces of water. And we'll shake it up. And we'll just mix one and a half, two minutes. Scrape our sides. Scrape the bottom. Now the trick to applying this without roller lines is to do small sections at a time. If I try to roll this whole thing out at once, you're probably gonna have roller lines, so you always do two to three foot sections, right? Get the top done. Once the top's done, I hit my edges, and then I do my final back roll on the top to eliminate any roller lines, and then I do the same thing. Another section, top, edges, do my back roll, and then I just kind of work down. So if you're doing kitchens, whatever projects you're doing, um, you wanna do them in sections like this, right? Don't try to do bigger sections because once this stuff's laid out thin, it starts to um, um, cure, so it'll start to get sticky. And then if you get, you always wanna double check your sections because I don't wanna get down to here and then notice a spot because if I come back, right, after like a couple minutes and hit a spot on a previous section, you're probably gonna notice that. So get your sections done, double check them different angles, make sure everything's hit and then move on. And then again, just keep, keep doing small sections and working down the line. And you shouldn't have any issues with roller lines and it should lay out perfect. All right, so after you hit your edges, sometimes your roller will kind of have an indent. I don't like to do my final back roll with that. So I like to roll it out, get the roller flat, and then do my back roll. And I always like to have the handle working away from the previous section. It just adds a little less weight to that edge and helps feather it out. And then, like I said, make sure everything's hit, look at different angles, and then move on. All right, there it is, guys. So we'll let this set up. Um, it can take anywhere from three, three to six hours, depending on the temperature. And then uh, 24 to 48 hours, we can reuse the surface and full cure on this urethane is seven days.